All right, so I'm Dottie Drockton, and I'm naturalist Linda. Thanks for tuning in tonight. We're going to be discovering today what um, birds use cavities and how to take care of the man-made cavities, that is, nest boxes that, that we provide. So. so Linda found this great bird's eye view from inside of a nest box. So that's what you're seeing. Right? That, that's right. That's what it is. <laughs> All right. So bef- to start, I, and maybe some of this, maybe I'm preaching to the choir out there, but necessities for all wildlife um, include food. So especially it is so important to provide um, native plants because all of our wildlife in Joggle County do best with native things, the things that grow here, the berries, um, the the fruit trees that are native, the wildflowers in the woods that are native. So, um, you know, blackberries, service berry, spice bush, dogwood, um, blueberries, all those things are wonderful food sources for um, our birds. And then of course we can provide food for them too. In the one picture there, the bluebird that they're eating a, a mixture of peanut butter, um, lard and cornmeal, and they just absolutely go crazy for it. And then the picture in the lower right-hand corner, there is a whole, how many bluebirds? Dottie's, Dottie knows about this. I'll let her tell her about it. So uh, just about the time we were putting this program together, a gentleman contacted my brother with this picture and said that he had in this picture, 36 bluebirds on his deck, but he has had as many as 60 bluebirds coming. And then in another picture that he sent me, he had a meal bag of mealworms that he bought at tractor supply that he was feeding in that tray. Now, I also feed beef suet and beef suet is another thing that the bluebirds at my house, I have at least a dozen bluebirds that are always feeding there uh, on the beef suet. So there are things like that. Uh, mealworms are more of a, of a treat, kind of like candy, like you wouldn't want to feed your grandkids candy all the time, although it attracts them and it brings them to your house. So that's with the bluebirds, you know, mealworms are something you want to attract them to your place and then provide them with other foods as well. Um, the fresh mealworms, the live mealworms are better than the, the freeze dried ones that, and, and you can look up that information. I looked it up as a result of some of the questions I had. Yeah. And the, the dried mealworms, they can actually, um, sort of interfere with a bird's digestive system. So I used to feed the dried ones and I don't anymore. I just think it's better if if we skip that. Live ones, of course, that's the better thing to provide for them if you're gonna do that. So we talked about food. The next important thing is water, especially if it can be moving water. Um, Maybe that, maybe the moving water is what will attract birds to your yard. So you can set up various um, ways to do that. These were all pictures from my garden. Um, Finally, I I put a little, I hung a bucket on a shepherd's hook and put a little valve in it so that it just dripped um, waters like a drop at a time into the bird bath. And it was amazing how fascinated the birds were with that. Then I upgraded it to this one that has a recirculating pump in it and you can actually adjust the flow of the water to maybe just slow it down and drop into that. And then I decided that I wanted more. So I installed my own pond and it's got a recirculating pump. And so um, water is very, very, very important, especially in the wintertime. If you can keep a heated bird bath or something like that, oh my gosh. Um, so I'm going to add my, my two cents here. So I did the uh, I, you might call it the lazy man's way, but I, I I have a property with a stream. So the stream is right below my bird feeders and that works too. So. That works. Yeah. Especially so. if, if you can keep open water in the winter time. I have a, I, so I have a pump that I dis that I let run all year, but I detach it from my piece of statuary there, the little frog that's spitting into the water and I just have it discharge right at the surface of the water so that even on the coldest days, um, the warmer water from the bottom keeps a hole open in the ice and you should see the birds flock into it in the winter time. So. so I will say that water is one of the most challenging things for wildlife to, to find in the winter. You would say, 
well, there's snow, they can eat the snow, but the ratio of water that you get from snow is you get, you have to have the volume be 10 times as much as the amount of water that you drink in order to get enough water into your system. And plus then you're cooling down your whole body, which birds body temperature is hundred some yeah, degrees. So, high so, so that's why running water or um, liquid water is what they really, really need. Yep. So we talked about food, we talked about water, and of course they need some sort of shelter. And that can be anything from like a brushy hedgerow um, to, you know, maybe um, there's a natural cavity or something on your property that a bird might use. Um, so we're gonna be talking about a little bit more about these cavity birds, uh, cavity nesting birds. And, um, you know, maybe sometime you'll see a barn owl or something. Uh, not that we've had any in Geauga County lately. They're not very common anymore. The last nesting barn owls in Geauga County that, that our park knows of were, were 1987. And so um, barn owls really need that open, uh, not mowed uh, meadows that, that have the meadow voles that they primarily feed on. So right. Ashtabula County, Trumbull County, some of the other counties out to the east might still have nesting pairs of barn owls. Yeah, and so um, I was gonna say something about this in the toilet. Oh, <laughs> oh, so before, anyway, barn owls, before barns came into being, what were they using? They were using natural cavities. So that's why we have the barn owl peeking out of that tree cavity there. All right, here's um, a few more examples of, of cavity nesting birds. So there's a couple kinds types of cavity nesting birds, primary and secondary cavity nesters. And you can probably figure out what that means. So primary cavity nesters are um, birds like woodpeckers, chickadees, and nuthatches that are actually able to peck into wood and create their own cavity. And so they, you might see them excavating um, a hole in a tree or something like that. Pilated woodpecker there right in the center is a perfect example of that. And then of course, the secondary cavity nesters are the ones that don't excavate their own cavity, but use ones that are already existing. So maybe a cavity that a woodpecker made that isn't used anymore, or um, a, cre a cavity created by a broken branch, you know, falls off the limb, falls off the tree, leaves a nice hole behind. And then of course, there are um, the artificial structures, the bird boxes, and things that we make for birds to use. So, now, I just have to add that a lot of people may not realize that woodpeckers are not killing the tree when they find and make a hole in a tree. Typically, what, what the reason they're making the holes in the tree is there, there are insects in there, the, the tree, and a lot of the birds like the chickadees can't really peck into a healthy tree. They they choose the softer wood of, of a tree that is already punky, already dying. Right. So right. That, that typically is the case. And I, you do see some pileated woodpecker holes, for instance, in a cherry tree that, that but oftentimes the, it's amazing, the tree will heal right around that hole and, and it'll be sealed off and, and the tree keeps on growing. So, yep. Yeah. So speaking of the pileated woodpecker, Here's a little video. Let's hope, hopefully we can get it to play. This was at the Westwoods in what year? 2015. So this pileated woodpecker is working, and this was in October. And so this bird probably wasn't thinking about nesting there, but they do use cavities to roost. So maybe that's what he looking for a place to be in the winter. Shelter that keeps him protected. I don't know if you can catch a quick view of the side of his face. This I think is a male. I could see. I could see. Oh, there it was. Yep, he's got a red mustache. So that's the male. Um, excavating that cavity. And we all have we have you all on mute. But uh, what kind of tree is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a sycamore. A sycamore tree. Yeah. And um, so actually, the pileated woodpecker 
um, it would take from three to six weeks for a pileated woodpecker to excavate a nest. So but they do leave a lot of chips down below. The, oh, so yeah. One of the ways you can tell where there is a pileated woodpecker hole or a net or someplace where they're working on the ants that are in the tree would be by the big chips that they leave in a pile down at the right. bottom of the tree. So they're going after those frozen ants that are in a decaying tree in the wintertime. So, you know, they're going after ansicles in there. Yeah, that's it. Oh, no, there we go. Okay. All right. So here's another um, primary cavity nester. But notice that it's sticking its head out of a man-made box. So even though they are primary cavity nesters, um, this little downy woodpecker, they will still take advantage of a man-made nest box. You mean this is a lazy woodpecker? <laughs> uh, basically, yes. They didn't read the book. So anyway, um, I have one at home that uses one of my bluebird boxes for roosting at night. And when I went to clean out the bluebird box in the springtime, this shower of little wood chips fell out of the box and inside the box, the woodpecker had pecked the sides of the box in order to get little wood chips to line the bottom of the box for like bedding. So these woodpeckers, they're gonna be using wood chips as the bedding in their boxes. Here's another one, the barred owl. This is the one that's whoo, 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 whoo. The one that says, who, who, who cooks for you? They're very talkative. The barred owl, yeah. <laughs> so this is different from the barn, B-A-R-N. And these are named for the barring that's on their chest. So if you look yep. down their chest and they have the brown eyes and they don't have the feather tufts that a great horned owl has. A great horned owl will nest in an old hawk nest. It'll steal the hawk nest before the hawk gets back yep. there to nest in the spring. But this is the barred owl and they, they're a little smaller than the great horned. So they find a cavity to protect themselves. Yeah, and um, they can be very vocal. Um, the adults do the who, who, who cooks for you or who cooks for you all or some combination of that. But oftentimes in the woods, you'll hear the begging calls of the young. And it, it always, I think, sort of freaks people out because this is what they sound like. Here, I'll, let me play a sound clip for you. Hope you can hear that. Trying to increase the volume for you. Yeah, I don't know if, if we if have to make... increase the volume or feed it. But it sounds like a screech that goes up a level and, and they they will continue it all night long until mom and or dad feeds them and so you'll hear it and you'll hear it and you'll hear it and you'll say why doesn't it stop well think of those feed little me, ones feed that me, want feed me. Feed. yeah <laughs> they're whining <laughs> they're very whiny yes here we go all right so um this so there's a great website. It's called Nest Watch. It's a Cornell University, um, you know, is in charge of it. And so if any of you have um, cell phones and want to photograph this side slide, this is um, just the basic protocol that gives you the whole size, the basic size of the box, and then some hints about where to locate it and then what to use in the bottom of the box for bedding. You could probably just go on Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Cornell, yeah, just, Cornell, Cornell Nest Watch would probably get you there. Yeah, so, and, uh, but anyway, so, um, but that's what we do now. Instead of taking notes at conferences that we go to, we just photograph slides. It's, I don't know, easier. So anyway. But they might be watching us. <laughs> I know, I, phone, that's so. right, that's, that could be, right. So, um, so anyway, nestwatch.org is, awesome website. It will give you everything that you ever wanted to know about bird nest boxes. So anyway, um, here's another cavity nester. It's a secondary cavity nester, the Eastern Screech Owl. This is Jaga County's second smallest owl. And it comes in two forms. It comes in a gray form and it comes in a red form. Um, but it also will use uh, either a natural cavity or it will use a nest box. 
So if you're ever out walking in the woods and you see um, holes in trees, take a look at those because sometimes you might see a little screech owl face peering out of it at you. And so um, now these guys weigh about six ounces. They're yeah. teeny tiny fluff, you know, balls of fluff, basically. That, that's... Right. And they sort of have two little ear tufts there on top. They're very cute. In fact, Tammy, our retired coworker, had a red phase screech owl nesting in, I think, her flying squirrel box or I and I think Dan has seen one in a mailbox that wasn't in years. <laughs> so. Yeah, so see they don't read the book. Uh, the American kestrel is another bird that will certainly take advantage of um, a nest box. And so Tammy, that's Tammy there in the picture with the long pole. She has her phone on the end of that pole. And so she'll raise it up and she'll stick the phone in the hole of the kestrel nesting box. And she has it timed to go off. And you know, you, you've got the timer on your cell phone. She sets it for like 10 seconds or whatever and goes up there, puts it in, goes flash, <laughs> brings it down. And so the two pictures in the top middle and the lower right are um, photographs of a male who's the more colorful one in the center top photograph and the female there on the lower right picture, who's not quite as colorful as he is. And, um, but anyway, so she has a nesting box project for kestrels that she started before she retired and um, has several um, folks who uh, volunteered to have a box installed on their property and they monitor it and let her know when it's time for her to um, ban the little babies. And I think so we got some... Before we go to the babies, just kestrels are a very small falcon. So they're yep. really speedy. They're the, one of the fastest birds. And they, the habitat, you probably won't find them if your property is mostly forested. Their habitat, you, you most often see them just sitting on a... Uh, wire as you're driving oh, down yeah, the road yeah. because the, in the op where they're open fields, they're out there hunting the rodents, especially and, and the grasshoppers and other yep. Sometimes and things a little that are, snake. Yeah, that that are out in those yeah. fields. So sometimes they take birds, but not not that often. It's not their right. preferred diet. But right. right. So yeah. So here's what the eggs look like. Again, these were photographs in the nest box that Tammy took the pictures. Um, you can see a bird's leg there in that one picture, um, a starling. So, so that's not attached to a that, bird anymore. No, it's not. <laughs> the starling is dead. Yeah. Yay. So, Sorry. Right, I didn't say yeah. that. <laughs> and we'll talk about starlings in a, in a little bit here coming up. So here's um, more um, absolutely adorable pictures of the little babies in the nests. And there's one egg there that hadn't hatched yet. We can't hear you, but we know you're saying, oh, <laughs> And here they are when they're a little bit older, getting um, the, their feathers have come in. And, and even actually at this age, you can tell males and females because they have the coloring. And here's one that just received its ankle bracelet there sitting on the scale. Wait, <laughs> the, the boys wear bracelets too? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> this the, so then the picture on the right, um, the males are in the left side of the container and the females are on the right side of the container. And if you're interested in specifically monitoring uh, a kestrel box nest, um, the website there on the screen um, will tell you everything that you need to know about how to do that. So um, isn't that, I love that picture sitting on the scale. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> Quit looking at me. <laughs> so um, screech owl, kestrel, um, the saw wet owl is our smallest owl. We didn't talk about it, but it's even smaller than the screech owl. They will use um, natural cavities as well. So this is the protocol from Nest Watch for Eastern screech owl and kestrel. So again, um, the bedding, two to three inches of wood shavings. And be sure that you're not using, you can't use treated wood on any of these boxes. Um, it needs to be, you know, cedar or plywood, something that doesn't have any chemicals. Well, plywood um, would have, would well, have glue. Well, glue. Um, so you, yeah, you have to be 
don't get treat don't build it out of treated wood cedar is probably yeah. the best right or pine maybe right anyway okay right. anyway yeah. moving on <laughs> so um there are even some species of waterfowl that will use cavities and the wood duck is a perfect example um, i was walking at the um it was lucia nash preserve it's the snow lake property and I saw two wood ducks fly up into a big beech tree and there was a hole in one of the limbs of the beech tree. I'm like, oh, I bet you those babies got a nest or I bet you those wood ducks have a nest of babies up there. And so they will use natural cavities or you can build them a nest box. But be sure that you always need to score the inside of the box beneath the hole to act as a ladder for the little ones to grab onto. You could also install a piece of like hardware cloth in there as a ladder up to the hole because the babies need to be able to get out. And yes, those little birds, the little ducklings, they will jump out of a nest that's 50 feet, you know, up in the tree. They so their, their first step out, if it's not over the water, is going to be, be onto the bouncing off the, the ground. The forest oh. floor, yeah. But they, but they also, you see those rocket shaped uh, structures out in, in many of our parks. Uh, it, it, th those are right, wood yep. duck nest boxes. Mm -hmm. And to get them out there, you either have to go out when the ice is really frozen solid, which would be a tough call, or you have to go out there in chest waders. Yep. To, to install these nest boxes, but the advantage to them being out there, not only the, that the babies will have a softer landing when they land in the water, but also that the predators Predator. like the raccoons that could easily get into that nest box and, and clean out the babies or the eggs can't get into the nest box if they're out in the water. Yep. The hooded merganser is another species that will use a nesting box. Um, one time at the rookery, we were doing a nature scopes program for the fifth graders. And we saw the whole class got to see a mother merganser, a mother hooded merganser um, standing on a log and the little babies were crawling up and taking shelter underneath her wings. It was so cool. <laughs> so um, if you're lucky, a hooded merganser might choose to use a nesting box as well. And so here's the protocol for the hooded merganser wood duck nest box. So they want four inches of shavings on the floor. Uh, again, the ladder or score the inside of the wood so that they can, you know, get a grip. And then um, actually this is different part of the protocol from monitoring other birds boxes, they want you to monitor the nest early in the evening when the hen tends to leave the nest to forage. Other birds, um, you don't want to check the, the box that it does. Right, yeah, we'll talk about that at the end coming up here. All right, the house wren. <laughs> this is a secondary cavity nester. Um, so with the house wren, the male wren, will fill all of the natural cavities around his territory with twigs. So if you open up your box and you see it stuffed with a bunch of twigs, you know you have a house wren in there. And so then what the female does is she goes around and visits all of the cavities that the, the male has filled with sticks and then she picks which one that she likes the best. And that's where um, she'll make a little depression in it and line the nest with, with grass and feathers and, and lay her eggs in there. So um, she'll be spending a lot of time there. So she gets her. Yeah. Her oh my gosh. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, you know, they can have, it looks like there's what, six eggs or seven, sometimes seven eggs in, an, in a clutch for the house wren. So, um, so there are other birds that share the nest boxes depending on. Uh, the size of the box and so on. But if you have a nest box that's close to the woods, the house wren is one of the occupants that you're likely to find. Yeah. So is there anything else I need to tell you about this particular one? Well, we just that covered. we know that sometimes people are not as happy to get have house wrens. They're looking for some of the birds we're gonna be talking about later, but house wrens are native birds 
they're very beneficial birds. They eat a lot of insects and, they, and we do want to encourage their nesting. Uh, chickadees are um, primary cavity nesters, meaning that they could excavate their own um, hole in a tree if the wood's soft enough. But again, they didn't read the book either, and they will happily use a wren house for um, nesting. And so a chickadee nest usually has a lot of um, mosses and things in it, moss and some um, hair. It might have some insect uh, cocoons. Um, so usually you can tell when you have a chickadee nest. Most of the ones that I've ever seen have a lot of moss. The, the majority of the nest is moss. Now, there are field guides and there's information that you can find. And birds instinctively know what kind of material is the type of material that their species of birds would use for nesting material. And, the, and so that's something, the, the size of the nest, the material that it's, that it's being used will tell you immediately what kind of bird is nesting there. And then I had an interesting little incident that happened at home one year. I was sitting in my backyard underneath a little dogwood tree on a bench. And as I was sitting there, I heard some commotion in a branch above my head and I, and a chickadee is up there and it's flitting around kind of from branch to branch above my head. And I'm like, what is going on? And so I'm sitting there and it gets closer. And then all of a sudden I feel bloop on my head and it starts picking at my hair, which hurt. I mean, you know, it was tugging it because it wanted to use it for nesting material. So um, another thing that you can do to help birds is if you want to set nesting material out, you know, clean out your hairbrush or daddy or, has horses. Or brush your dog. This brush time the dog, year. yeah. yeah throw, that, throw that fur out there in the yard and the birds will pick it up. Yep, it, and use it for their, <laughs> yep, use it for their nests. So here's the tufted titmouse and um, a white-breasted nuthatch. So Tufted tit mice are secondary cavity nesters. The, the white and the red-breasted nuthatches are primary cavity nesters. But again, those primary cavity nesters sometimes will use um, nest boxes. So they'll take advantage of, of um, items that we provide for them. So um, here's a picture, an interesting picture here. And I want you to look right here where the circle is. That is a tufted tit mouse. And he's on the back of, the, of that raccoon. And what is he doing? He's doing the same thing the chickadee was doing to me, plucking out the hair in order to use it in their nest. So tit mice have nests that are lined with moss, fur, bark, leaves, grass, sometimes even some snake skin in there. And then um, white-breasted nuthatches are usually just using soft, um, shreds of bark or hair or feathers in, in their nests as well. So um, here's the golden swamp warbler, the prothonotary warbler. Um, so With a beautiful song as well. Yes, it's really the only one that, it's the bird that, that says tweet, 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 tweet. <laughs> so, but yeah. not, it, it, it's much more melodic. Yes, Linda, not, sorry. yeah. No. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, if you've ever kayaked or canoed at Russell Park and noticed um, these round nesting containers, which actually were formerly Metamucil jars that Dan Best, our retired naturalist, um, made into birdhouses for the prothonotary warbler. And he set them in posts in a little um, trail along the river at Russell Park. So that would be the Cuyahoga River. Cuyahoga River, right, yep. Yeah. And this is a, a bird that likes floodplains. And um, so, I mean, I was at uh, McGee Marsh one time and all these people were crowded around a tree and, and the tree happened to be next to the parking lot. And, and I'm like, what are they looking for? There's a prothonotary warbler. I mean, they were literally probably 40 people 
with their binoculars looking at a prothonotary warbler. And I thought, oh, we see them all the time and <laughs> along the Cuyahoga River. But that's because Dan and uh, other people that have assisted Dan have worked on that. And they have personally increased the population of prothonotary warblers to where Geauga County now is a destination for a lot of birders that want to see this bird. Yep, it's, it's really cool. Pretty amazing. And so being out there on the river, in the river, they, the nest boxes, again, are not susceptible to predators that would otherwise go for cavities and trees. And Dan has to take his kayak out there, gets to take his kayak out there in all kinds of weather. When the river is in flood stage, he has to yeah. change the level yeah. of these boxes so that the river doesn't get in the box. Right. They're on adjustable <clears throat> poles that he can raise and put a pin through so that they're always above the flood stage of the um, of the river. So uh, prothonotary nests mostly um, are made of moss, dry leaves, twigs, bark, and uh, lined with fine materials. And interesting that lately Dan has noticed a decrease in the use of the nest boxes um, because now there is an abundance of tree cavities that are available for these birds because of that nasty little pest called the emerald ash borer, which killed a whole bunch of ash trees in the floodplain. And ash trees grow in the floodplain. They grow right. in, in wet soils. They're a, a tree that, that populates that area. So if you go along, for instance, the bike trail going south from headwaters, you'll see that there are lots of dead trees. And you think, well, what, what's going on? Well, it's all those dead ash trees that you might have in your yard as well. Right. No, the, the woodpeckers have loved it <laughs> because they eat the larva. But um, so anyway, but the prothonotary warblers, a lot of them, uh, Dan noticed, are preferring to use the natural cavities as opposed to the nest boxes. So anyway, so here are the house wren, chickadee, nut hatch, titmouse, nest box protocol. Um, so the whole, the entrance hole is important uh, so that it's sure to keep out unwanted birds that we'll talk about in a couple minutes there. Um, so height five to 10 feet. And here is the prothonotary warbler nest box protocol, slightly bigger entrance hole. Um, but look at some of the circled items there needs to be with six, within 16 feet or directly over standing or slow moving water. They like shade. They like to have their box in the shade. And then if you're putting it in the water, it's gotta be at least three to five feet above the high water level um, and face it so that it's oriented so that it's facing the land. So if you have a wetland area on your property, it might be something you'd want to try with yeah. these great birds. Yeah. Oh, I would love it. Yeah. They're they're beautiful. They're amazingly bright yellow when you see them. So I, I think they should call them the golden swamp warbler. It's like prothonotary. I don't even know what prothonotary <laughs> means. Anyway. All right, moving along here. Um, so the great crested flycatcher is a woodland species that are secondary cavity nesters. They make a bulky nest of leaves and a variety of other materials. And if you look real close, you might be able to see the snake skin that is in this particular nest as well. Now, great crested flycatchers are not something you usually see. We don't even really see them very often in our nest boxes, but we hear them a lot. They're, right. they're very vocal birds. And once you hear their voice, you'll recognize them. Yeah, it's a beautiful bird, sort of yellow, and you can't see in this picture, but the back of it is sort of cinnamon colored. So it's um, a very beneficial bird. Fly catcher, guess what it likes to eat? So, and there's your um, nest box protocol. Notice this one, it likes to have a hanging box, which discourages some starlings and other predators. So that's an important thing to know about that particular species. Now, these are ones that you're probably more familiar with when you walk at our parks like Burring Meadows and, um, and Orchard Hills Parks. You're going, to, or even out of Swine Creek along the pond there, you're going to see 
these nest boxes and you're going to see these birds. Yeah, so um, this bird is one that competes with the bluebird for nesting sites. And so how do you solve that little problem? Well, you pair the boxes. So you put two boxes out together, 20 to 25 feet apart. And that way the tree swallows can have one box and the bluebirds can have the other box and there's no, you know, fighting and stuff like that. Everybody's so happy. You, you won't have two nests of, a, of two different tree swallow families. You won't have two nests of two different bluebird families, but you will, could have a tree swallow and a bluebird almost next to each other, and they don't seem to mind that. The, the yeah. territorial thing is more species related. Absolutely. So here's an example of what the paired boxes are. This is furring meadows. And so um, I think we have uh, 12, uh, I can't remember how many bluebird boxes we have there, maybe 12 or 12, I don't, I don't remember. Anyway, so. Well, Linda doesn't monitor them. We have bluebird box, box docs. docs that, so that's a volunteer that, project yeah. if somebody's interested in it that, that people do um, to keep, keep, well, we'll tell you what monitoring means. Yeah. yeah. This is a tree swallow nest. You'll know that you have a tree swallow um, if you see a nest that's got so many feathers in it that sort of cover over and shelter the eggs inside the box. Um, and or you'll, or, you'll be, or you'll be dive bombed by, by the, one by yes, the tree swallows. It's snapping at your head. <laughs> they're pretty They're pretty territorial against us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're, they're really not gonna hurt you, but that dive bombing can be a little disconcerting. A little, yeah, a little, a little intimidating there. And so then we have our Eastern Bluebird. And um, so most people that deal with nest boxes probably are doing something with bluebirds. So um, you'll be able to tell a bluebird nest, it's made out of grasses. The majority of it is made out of grasses, but I have seen on my property, they use pine needles. We've got a couple of pine tree plantations on our property and I've seen Neat pine needles um, woven into the nest. Sometimes they'll use, use grapevine shreds, so you might see that in the nest as well. Um, now, habitat is critical for the bluebird. If you live in the woods, like I do, you'll have the bluebirds around in the winter, but you're not going to see them nesting at your place. They're going to go to some place that it, it will show you it's more open area. Yeah. yeah. A normal clutch size for a bluebird is, you know, four to six eggs. They can be blue, they can sometimes be white, so don't be surprised if you see white eggs in your um, box. There's a couple shots of both the male and the female. Oh, look at their, they've got, that was probably, oh, see, Tammy Gimmer took that picture. Those, those were probably bluebirds at her farm, and she feeds them live mealworms, and then they feed the mealworms to their babies when they have um, nestlings in there. I have seen bluebirds use natural cavities and that's what they used to do before, you know, um, before people build houses for them. In fact, they would nest in fence posts on farms and things like that. So um, I did see one actually using a, a natural cavity on my property. It was in a maple tree. There was a hole on a dead branch up there and they were in there. So if you're going to attract new uh, bluebirds, they like open grassy areas, um, 300 feet apart if you're like want a trail or something on, on your um, property. And then of course, if you're having problems with tree swallows, then put up a pair of boxes. Or if you're having a problem with you, with, I mean, it can't, isn't necessarily a problem to have the, the tree swallows or the rats right. or so on, but you can you can put up several boxes and then you can have several species of birds. Right. So this is typical bluebird habitat, nice open meadows. Don't put your box here because you could end up getting house wrens in it. And they don't recommend 
putting a box on a tree. I have a story to tell you about a box, a bluebird box that I had it on a tree hanging in my backyard. So I noticed one day that the bluebirds were flying at their box. They weren't going in. They were making a lot of commotion. And I was like, something's wrong with that box. And they had nest, they had young in the nest. So I go to the tree, I open up the box and it's full of gypsy moth caterpillars. And I was like, oh God. So they weren't, the caterpillars weren't on the babies. They weren't bothering the babies, but the, the it's whole inside of the box was packed with caterpillars. So I, we took the box off the tree. I, I told my brother, I said, we cannot hang this box back on the tree. I took the nest out of the box with the babies in it. I put the nest in a shoe box, cleaned out the bluebird box. We torched the inside of the box with a blowtorch just to make sure that we didn't have any more gypsy moth larvae in there. And so then we got a, a, a post and we probably maybe six feet away from the tree that the box had been attached to. We hung it on the post. We put a predator guard on it. I put the nest back into the box, closed it up, and within 10 minutes, the bluebirds were happy. They were in and out of there feeding their young. So they can tolerate some human commotion, and sometimes you have to do that if the nest has issues. So bluebirds so, are more tolerant of, yeah. and, and, and tree swallows and house friends are more tolerant of our interference with or our protection of them by the things that we do with their boxes. Whereas some of the other birds wouldn't tolerate that. Right. You, you would have nest failure. Right. So here's the nest box protocol, preferably a freestanding post, not necessarily a fence post or a tree, but I'm, you know, I had, I told you about my issue with the caterpillars. Um, the entrance hole, uh, one and a half inches, at least five feet up from the ground. Always face the nest box, um, the hole either south or east or southeast, somewhere in that vicinity, because that way it's away from the prevailing weather. Most of our weather comes from the west, so um, having it face that way, um, they like it. In fact, we have one box in our backyard that um, that faces east, and they always want that box. I think it's because the morning sun hits it. So anyway, um, and a predator guard, put some kind of a predator guard. So there's, um, here's some examples of predator guards. You've got your PVC pipe uh, or a piece of, you know, stove pipe or whatever. And then the, um, that cone shaped baffle. But I have had raccoons get around the cone shaped baffle. So it, just be sure that it's big enough. They can't kind of reach around it. So when you're monitoring uh, your, your box, and this goes for all birds, not just bluebirds, try and have them cleaned out before March 1st because birds start looking for cavities really early in the year. I mean, we've, I've seen already, I've seen some um, you know, courtship behavior from um, some nuthatches, some, some titmice, so you know, now's the time. Um, try and visit the box at least once a week. They say starting in March, but usually here, unless we have an unusually warm March, um, it's usually towards more towards end of March or April. Be a little bit careful in the colder weather, right? Because if there's incubation going on and you get that the adults off the nest, that, that it, it's going to be nest failure. And there could be nest failure just because it's so cold this time of year that it, it, unfortunately that happens then you, the monitoring means that you might have to clean out a box that right. the, the nest has failed, the, yeah. the, the eggs are, are not going to hatch because they got too cold during the cold weather. And we've yeah. had that happen at the park because yeah. we've had some cold spells yeah, in the we, middle we, of, after, after some warm, warm like right. we're yeah. having this week. And then, yeah. yeah. Um, so this is your nest box monitoring toolkit. Um, particularly for bluebirds. Um, so 
carry a box of a shoe box or something that in case you have to take the nest out of the box, you can put the nest with the babies in it. Sometimes you have to re you have to build them a new nest because of some pests that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, so that spatula there, um, which is, what do you use it for? Laying bricks or something? Putty, putty, whatever. Putty knife. Putty knife. Yeah. yeah, whatever. Um, so you can just sort of slide the putty knife in underneath the nest and lift it up and out if you need to actually, you know, do something with the nest. Um, paper towels to, um, sometimes the birds will poop, you know, and you can clean out the, um, uh, box before you, you put them back in. Um, a uh, screwdriver for opening the box. All our, of our, some of your nest boxes will just have, have a, little a little flange that right. you can move, but our, ours have, we screw have screwdrivers screw, so that yes. we keep people from right disturbing them. Right. And then carry some dry grass with you because sometimes you do have to build them a new nest. Or you so. can use you know, soft hay, like yep. if you have grassy hay, yep. like I do, you know, you can use that. So here's some issues that you can run into with um, monitoring a, a nest box. Mice can get in there. Um, Especially in the wintertime. They, they, yeah, they think they that's a great place yep, for overwintering. And in the summer, stuff. yellow jackets yep. or, or wasps. Yeah, there's ants in this particular box. So this is the other problem, uh, blowfly larva. So these are maggots from that So if you just there. take dinner, you might not want to watch this part. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so the blowfly um, can parasitize the little bluebirds. And so if you notice that there are blowfly larvae in the bottom of the box, you're going to have to take the nest out rebuild them a new nest, you're gonna to have to check the babies over to make sure there's no larvae that are clinging to them. And if there are, you have to pick them off because if these larvae get onto the little bluebirds, they suck the blood and then they can weaken the bluebird. So, um, and especially, you know, the babies, they're pretty helpless when they're first, um, you know, first young before they get their feathers. So it's really important if you see blowfly larvae in there, you're going to have to build them a new nest. Some of the nest boxes actually have hardware cloth that it allows the blowfly larva to, to fall, fall through, through so that they are not up against the nest. So you might want to look up a plan for that. You can even add it to right, your nest could. box if, mm -hmm. if you don't have them in your nest box. Yeah, just cut like a little slot in the in the two sides of the box and then just slide the little piece of hardware cloth in there so that it sits about maybe a half inch or so from the up from the bottom of the box. That can help. Uh, we currently at the park don't have those in our boxes. Um, but that's something that you could try and, and see if that would, you know, solve the, the um, blowfly issue, right? And then we have the issue with our non-native species, which um, there's two, the European starling. Now, um, if your nest box hole is the right size, you won't get starlings in, right. in the bluebird boxes or the wren house. And I, I just want to give you a heads up. Those of you that use the Peterson box, which is the box that has the slanted front with an oval hole and not a round hole. I have had starlings get in those boxes. So now um, I still use Peterson box on my property, but I'm putting a round hole in it, not the oval hole. And I haven't had issues with starlings. So just beware. Um, some people haven't had issues, but they, they were able to get in. So I'm not using the oval hole anymore. The house sparrow is another non-native species. These birds are not to be encouraged. You'll know you have a house sparrow nest if it looks like that. It is just a messy jumble of all kinds of junk, garbage, pieces of trash, feathers, and it's just sort of stuffed in there and it's a very messy nest. And the picture on the right is what happens to the bluebirds when they have young, or they even will do this to an adult. They will go in the box, 
they will peck the heads and kill the bluebirds. And then they build their nest right on top of the yeah. dead birds. So um, these are not native birds. And so therefore they are able to be dispatched. So um, we have at home this, this, this little thing called a 410 with birdshot. And um, so that's the way we take care of problem house sparrows. Now you can recognize a house sparrow. Look at that picture on the left there. And you can see that dark, dark collar on, underneath his neck and the dark across his eye. There are lots of other native sparrows and you don't want to get rid of the native sparrows or you don't want to get rid of the house wrens. Those guys are federally are, protected. Our right. native species are federally protected, but these are not. Now, we, uh, we talked about some other options. You can put up three boxes, one for the tree swallows or one for the house wrens, one for the bluebirds, and one for the house sparrows. The one with the house sparrows, you outsmart the house sparrows by making sure that their eggs will never hatch because you go in when you're monitoring that box and you can either put a little hole and put a little X on the egg so that you know that that's one that you took care of. You can put them in the freezer. freezer yeah. you, you can addle the egg, which means shake, shake them so yeah. that they, they, you break the in, innards yeah, of that egg. Yeah. And so there are some options like that. And then they'll sit on those eggs and they'll think they're incubating the eggs and they'll leave everybody else alone. Right. And, yeah. But they never hatch out offspring, which you really do right. not want to encourage no. this population no. because you see them everywhere. You see them in barns. You see them at the gas station when you're on the corner. You see them every place you go because they are so highly successful that they they have populated everywhere in our human habitats. Yeah. The ironic thing is though that in England where these birds came from, they're not doing so well over there. Go figure. So anyway, um, also you can buy a sparrow trap, which goes inside the bluebird box. I couldn't find a good picture of it, but that also was another option. Uh, but then but then you have to dispatch the bird somehow. So that may be not so pleasant, but anyway. Uh, and then of course we get some other squatters that can move into bluebird boxes of the squirrel, flying squirrel, red squirrel, mouse, raccoons, um, especially when you mount them on trees, trees and things like that. Yeah. So here is the nestwatch.org um, main page. And so anything you want to know about nesting birds, you can pretty much find here. Now, th this is protocol that uh, if you're going, you're doing it through them, is that because it says enter? Yeah, data? If, if you, right. So, so you can do the, your monitoring through the Nest Watch and then there's, you know, forms and things that you can fill out. Um, but they, this just gives you good information for right. how you want to monitor right. your nest box and what you want. And right. and there are lots of other societies, bluebird societies and other things right. that you're doing have, bluebirds yeah. in particular. And they'll show a, a whole history of each day of in the yeah. nest box, yeah. what you should be seeing. So yeah. if, if you're a newbie to this, you can see those things. And we're focusing on bluebirds because bluebirds really, are uh, just like the prothonotary warblers are were brought, their numbers were brought back by the fact that people, people are helping were, them. were helping them yep. with the nest boxes. But but you can enjoy all those other birds we were talking about too. We're, we're just focusing on these because these seem to be the ones that people are most interested in. Mm -hmm. So here's some other tips, um, especially things to avoid, like harming the nest or spending too much time at the box so that the adults you know, desert the nest. They're they're suggesting that one minute is uh, is a good um, baseline for doing that. Now, bluebirds can tolerate. You know, when I had to do the gypsy moth thing, I was maybe like five to ten minutes getting that straightened out, and they were fine. Other bird species would not be able to tolerate 
that length of time. So shoot for as little time at the nest box as possible. And it says, don't check in the early morning. That's when they, they're really in, eager to get that food to those babies who have waited all night and they haven't had any food. But the other reason, thing is you don't want to be checking it. I mean, maybe it's convenient when you come home from work, but if you're checking it in the evening, that that's a time when they're settling down in there and they're going to be keeping the babies warm and you know you don't or keeping the eggs warm and you don't want to go at that time right. um and and this goes for nests that might be in shrubbery around your house i, I i've seen a cardinal nest that is in some, my in somebody's property and people show everybody that's there oh i want to you want to go see the cardinal nest well you then you have disturbed that nest so often and oftentimes you're you're actually setting a trail the raccoons follow human trails because they know oftentimes it leads to food and it may not be that they know that there's a nest there but they're following a human trail because they're looking for food and they find that nest and Yep, there goes your nest. So, so that's that's the little image there in front. Don't leave a dead end trail when you go up to. So don't walk right up to the next nest box, and then turn around and walk back in the same direction. Do sort of a sideways, you know, like the picture shows there, so that if a predator is following you, it's going to follow your footprints right past the nest instead of stopping right at the place where the nest is. And then all of these things are kind of like common sense. Um, you know, don't check during bad weather. Don't check at dusk. You know, uh, so um, anyway, but this information, you can find it all on the Nest, uh, nest Box Protocol. Oh, no, oops. Oh, oh, I did that. I probably did that. <laughs> Sorry. So here's some resources. Um, the Cornell All About Birds has um, great information about um, life history and nesting and things like that. The Ohio Bluebird Society, if you're particularly interested in bluebirds, they have all kinds of uh, great resources there that you can look at. Um, there's the uh, DNR um, Backyard Wildlife. Um, it's a PDF that you can look at for attracting. Um, is a pamphlet that you could actually right. print out, which is a tr talks about attracting all sorts of wildlife to your backyard. So that's very helpful. So um, now I think we're out of time.